Welcome back. My name is Yukio Lipid. I am the faculty director of the arts at the Radcliffe Institute and a co-organizer of this conference, which is titled Game Changers, Sports, Gender, and Society. I'd like to offer just a few brief comments uh, before introducing our next two speakers. The conference keynote speaker, Leila Ali, in conversation with our moderator, Christine Brennan. Now, we trust that by now, if you've been following the conference, you share our, the conviction of the organizers that the relationship between sports and gender and society is complex and ever-evolving, and that now seems to be a particularly opportune moment to reflect upon and re-examine its many dimensions. Uh, this morning, we heard a panel that did so from a historical perspective, framed, of course, uh, uh, through a consideration of the consequences of Title IX and what it means for athletic participation and gender equality. It, this panel included a, a really beautiful meditation on this idea of uh, sports as a birthright, as somehow a fundamental part of what it means to be human, of sports as a basic part of the human experience, and the challenges that have faced women and people with disabilities in staking a claim to it. We also heard in the late morning in the panel on gender and wellness uh, of a host of perspectives on this issue uh, from uh, the NC2A perspective from the World anti uh, US Anti-Doping Agency and community sports and how to think about gender, uh, the issue of gender and difference in sports from myriad perspectives, neurophysiological, biomechanical, uh, from the perspective of uh, the, from legal, cultural, social. Uh, we also learned why the Scandinavian countries are uh, the happiest in the world. Later this afternoon, we'll be exploring yet a different set of issues in the panel, gender, media, and popular culture. It goes without saying that we have now been living in a saturated media culture for some time now, uh, from that moment that was so, I think, well captured in the movie uh, Anchorman 2, when Ron Burgundy, played by Will Ferrell, is being recruited during the 1980s by an executive for a new 24-hour news channel, GNN and uh, blurts out, that is without doubt the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You might say that the afternoon panel examines what happens in the wake of the emergence of GNN, and more generally of sports through the culture of sports, the fandoms, the media practices, and the popular cultures with which sports have become so imbricated. Now, as a conference organizer, I can tell you that the Radcliffe Institute is this interesting place where the faculty directors get together with the dean and administrators and propose conference themes. Then we propose an absolutely improbable dream list, ex uh, list of world experts to address them. And then we go out and ask them and they say yes, and here we are. <laughs> Amazing. And nowhere is this more the case than with our keynote speaker, Leila Ali. She needs no introduction, and you will find in our conference booklets an extensive bio for her, uh, as with all of our speakers. But let me just say her that in her remarkably wide-ranging achievements and experiences as a boxing champion and world-class athlete, actress, commentator, and past president of the nonprofit Women's Sports Foundation, Leila Ali has lived or embodied in one form or another many of the issues that are, we are addressing in today's conference. She's an advocate for equality for women in the world of professional sports who is both powerful and thoughtful, someone who will be able to offer unique perspectives on the many questions that emerge at the intersection of sports and gender. And we are absolutely delighted and privileged to have her here. And it was a tall order to find an interlocutor who could activate to the fullest this opportunity for engagement with Leila Ali. But we have somehow found the ideal person. Christine Brennan, an award-winning national sports columnist and best-selling author whose pioneering status in sports journalism offers her equally unique insights into the issues we've been addressing throughout the day. And she has just flown in from a blustery day in uh, Augusta, Georgia, covering the Masters uh, to be here with us, and it's a real honor to be able to have her join us today. And before welcoming them to the stage, let me explain how this will proceed. After Leila Ali and Christine Brennan conclude their conversation, we will take questions from the audience. A mic will be placed in the central aisle, and we ask that you come up to the mic, introduce yourself before asking your question. Now, I'm just going to uh, linger here for just a few seconds because I'm pretty sure that this is the only time in my life that I'm gonna be able to introduce a uh, world-renowned undefeated boxing champion. <laughs> so, Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Leila Ali and Christine Brennan to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 
Wow, is my mic on? Yes, how are you doing? Good. I'm really excited to be here, honored to be here. I've already learned a couple new words. <laughs> words I need to go look up, thank you. But uh, thank you so much to Dean Elizabeth Cohen for inviting me, and like I said, I'm honored to be here, share my story with you. Um, looking forward to discussing my story with you. Um, I just want to start by saying that I think all of us know that now more than ever, um, we're, we're living in a time where women especially need to be inspired um, to find that greatness within themselves um, that we all have. I think that we're champions, we're warriors, we're definitely athletes, we know that. Um, that's what I love about sports. I love that sports can be a vehicle for us as women to find all of those leadership qualities that are there. Um, one of the biggest regrets that I have, um, I have very few, aside from some of the guys maybe in the past <laughs> I dated, but uh, one of the biggest regrets that I have is that I didn't play sports growing up. Um, a lot of people assume that I did. Um, they also assume that I got into boxing because my father is the greatest of all times, but I actually didn't want to box myself until I saw women boxing on television for the first time. And I remember that moment like it was yesterday. I was in complete awe and wanted to do it um, myself. So I think of that now you know, as me being an, an athlete and a role model to other girls um, growing up, not even necessarily to want to become a boxer, but just you know, expanding our minds of what's possible for us to do. Um, so again, I'm honored to speak to you all here today, and I would love to just go through that story with you guys. All right. Yes. Well, what a great uh, opening statement. And you know, I was I was saying we were just in the green room, and I was saying you know that thing, the schoolyard thing, like you know my dad can take your dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, that wasn't so good. <laughs> hey, maybe my mom could take your mom. Probably not that either. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> I'm just joking. My All mom's right. a little feisty, no? I'm well, my mom was. <laughs> so okay, I'm zero for two. <laughs> You said, you talked about your dad, and when we were chatting a few days ago, just to kind of prepare for this, and what a wonderful scene this is to see all of you in this gym, in this historic setting, I, my goodness, I, the old boys club of Augusta National are here, I think I should just stay here. <laughs> um, but, all right, I'll stay. But we were talking, and I said, is it okay to talk about your dad? And you said, of course. And there's so many ways we could go with the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, but you just touched upon it. So you did not really play, you didn't play sports, you didn't think you'd be a boxer, and as I recall, your dad was not exactly thrilled when you said, hey dad, I wanna be a boxer. Why don't you tell everyone that story? Because I think it's illustrative of not only, of course, your personal story, but also of a girl trying to say to a dad, hey, I wanna play sports, and a dad kind of being reluctant, and then obviously, finally coming around, Definitely. right? Well, for me, um, you know, I, I'm not just any girl, and it wasn't just any dad. You know, this is, <laughs> this is Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all times. You know, he has his youngest daughter now um, wanting to box. So he didn't have any of his kids. I don't think he wanted any of his kids uh, to box. Um, and, and that's, we can go into that later, but that's, as a fighter, I wouldn't want my kids to box either. So it's just one of those things. But for me, um, I decided that I wanted to start training um, after I saw women's boxing on television. And I was in school full time, um, and I had a business. I had a nail salon, because I started going to school to learn how to do nails when I was 16. And I built up my clientele, saved up my money. I was subleasing. And I had this whole plan, like, and I'm a planner. So I was like, I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna live on my own, which I did, and I am gonna focus on you know, building this business. And all of a sudden I see women's boxing, and I'm like, within myself, and, I had- did you, How did you see it? Did okay, so I, was, I turned on television to watch a Mike Tyson fight. Um, and I wasn't a big boxing fan, but I watched the big fights, and then here come these women into the ring on the undercard. So I think that was the first time a lot of people saw women's boxing. Um, and that moment, that's when the seed was planted within me. And I remember saying, I want to do that. And I was with my best friend and her father. He said, Layla, you won't, those women will take your head off, you know. And I was like, no, I can do it, I can do it. But then when I went home and the fear and the doubt started to set in, and like, I don't know if I'd be able to do it, meaning change my plans. You know, I've told everybody, I've said, this is my plan. And then, you know, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? Just all of that. I was a young girl. Um, and then, but 
that feeling did not go away. So I thought about it for like, I think about a year. I'm, I'm really bad with timelines, but it was about a year. And then I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go find a trainer and start training. And I did it all on my own. I didn't ask my dad for help. I was still trying to figure out if it was something I actually wanted to do, if I had the talent to do. Because I knew I was gonna be successful with this nail business and becoming an entrepreneur. And boxing was so new for me. So I went to the gym, started training, and at a certain point, my father found out about it, and I had already decided that, yes, I was in fact going to do it, and that's when he asked me, you know, I hear that you came in town, because he didn't live in Los Angeles, and said, you know, I hear that you're boxing and you're gonna start fighting. I was like, yeah, I am. And he basically tried to talk me out of it indirectly. That's how my father, he brings up every negative thing that he possibly can. Mm -hmm. You know, well, what happens if you get knocked out? What happens if you get knocked down? The whole world's gonna be watching you. And all of my answers are basically, well, when you got knocked down, you got back up. And I don't think I'm gonna get knocked out, but if I do, I'm gonna ask for a rematch, you know? And I gave him all these answers. It's like, what else could he say? And he knew he was talking to Layla, and he knows Layla is gonna do what she wants to do. So he was like, okay, he, he knew he couldn't tell me not to do it. So we had that talk, and I just said, hey, you're either gonna support me or you're not, you know? And he made it very clear that he didn't really think women should be fighting. My father was a little bit of a male chauvinist, um, and so that was something I was like, I'm not gonna try to um, you know, change your mind about that uh, other than I'm gonna show you what I can do. I'm gonna show you that I can do it. So I started boxing, and um, needless to say, I, well, maybe I do need to say it, I did change his mind about it. Um, you know, he, he, he was like, wow, you really can fight, women can fight. So he had a whole different, um, you know, thought in his mind when it came to women in the ring. So. Did he come to any of your fights? He did, he was at most of my fights. He, he didn't make it to all of them just because he was sick and couldn't always be there. Um, but he was there, yeah, he was, for over half of the fights he was there. So when he showed up, did he try to sneak in the back or? <laughs> oh, my dad, no. Right. <laughs> he was that, every time, good, he, every time he walked in, Every time he walked in, it was like, Ali, 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 you know, and he loved well, it. So but that's good for you, because then was, the crowd was on your side. Well, oh. yeah, but the crowd, <laughs> what, was, what was surreal about my boxing career was just that I felt like I was fighting for both of us, because he couldn't, you know, just with his Parkinson's, and I knew I could see in his eyes he would love to be back in that ring again, and he couldn't. So, like, I felt like I was kind of doing it for him, and he was living through me as well. So when he walked in and that everyone started chanting Ali, and then again when I came out, um, and I could just, you know, I never really focused on my dad, whether he was gonna be there or not, because as a fighter, I like to just really be focused on the, the mission at hand. I can't worry about who's in the audience, none of that. And then after the fight, I'd always look for my dad, you know, and just kind of see that joy and excitement in his eyes, so. And when you look at him, it was, was it, an, an, again, I know he was gradually losing the abilities that, that obviously made him who he was, but, his personality. I mean, did you see it in his eyes? Would oh, he yeah. Nod? Would he, would he, what would he do to, tell, to show you how much he was loving what you were doing after being so reluctant at first? Well, my father, first, well, first of all, he told me um, that he had a change of heart. Um, so I changed his mind about just, not just me, but women in general being able to fight. Um, and then he had to get past my father's Muslim, and I'm not, and a lot of people assume that I am, but that was an issue just wearing a sports bra and shorts in the ring with him. And it's like, Dad, really? You know, like, you think that's what you're thinking about? But just being able to watch me in the ring as a fighter and not seeing a woman, per se, but seeing a fighter. And he knows that, you know, you have to respect the game. He knows how hard it is to train and to prepare and all of that. And it has nothing to do with being a woman or being a man. You know, so just for him to be able to see past all of that and, and show me my respect and at the same time be so surprised because he wasn't there to see me train. He didn't know what he was going to see. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to see the way that I was able to dominate. And then, of course, he's like, you're just like me, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> now you want to take credit. Okay. <laughs> So a few years after this, you, uh, with, through Billie Jean King and everyone at the Women's Sports Foundation, some of the folks have been around, uh, obviously, here at, at the conference, um, the wonderful Women's Sports Foundation, which does so much good work, they basically kind of twist your arm, and pretty soon you're president of the Women's Sports Foundation. Yes. Right? Yes. That's Billie Jean King for you. <laughs> she got me good. Right. You, you say hello, and you're now you're president of the Women's yes. Sports Foundation. <laughs> She knew what she was doing of because of your did. personality, <laughs> because of everything that you've just described for us. So what did you take from your personal experience and taking a dad, in this case, one of the most famous dad in the world, one of them, and turning him around and saying, hey, you can look at me as an athlete, not as a girl. It's not just a girl playing a sport. This is an athlete playing a sport. What did you then take and, and how did that help you 
as you then went to this global role of being the, uh, the face of women's sports for a couple of years? Those, this is one of those questions I'm going to answer, and I'm going to get so deep, I'm going to forget what the question was. It's OK. I'm, that's why I'm here. So um, <laughs> thank you. Um, now, if I forget, we're in trouble. Right, right. The thing is, is that the way I approached my career and life um, is that I, don't, I never really worried about what my dad thought or what anybody else thought. I worried about what I thought about myself. So for me, um, I had something to prove to myself first, and I had really high expectations of myself. So um, with my father, I kind of was just like, I'm, I've, I've always been confident. I know I get that same confidence from him because I had been training and I knew what I could do. I'd already proved to myself that I can do this and I can be a champion. And you're just going to sit back and you're going to watch. So for me, I was not really concerned even with him going in because I was, it didn't hurt my feelings. I wasn't like, I can't believe my own father is not, you know, I was just like, look, Peace. See you later. I'm about to go do this, and um, you know you can come along for the ride or not. You know, so that was one thing that I took the burden off of myself to feel like I had to, you know, please my dad or change his mind. I felt like that was going to happen naturally, and that's the same way that I've just approached the sport in, in life. Like I don't really. It's too much to have to worry about what everybody else is thinking. Like if I can stay focused on what my goals are and being the best that I can be, because that takes so much energy and focus and, and dedication to begin with, then um, you can't do anything but change your mind at, at the end of the day, because it is what it is. You know, we all, if you're honest with yourself, you know, so I think that that's what changes, um, you know, when people think women can't do something, you see someone do it, they think they can't because maybe they've never seen it before, but as soon as you see it, you learn something new, it changes that information, right? And you're like, oh, so I think, Right now, my focus is just being the best that I can be and then inspiring others along the way. But I try not to put that burden on myself of, I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to please this person. And I think that a lot of times as women, sometimes we do that because we feel, and, and that's not to say that I don't feel responsible and I don't make smart choices along the way because I do take being a public person and a role model very seriously. Um, there's opportunities that come up that I have, and I'll turn them down just because of the way it might come off or just because, um, uh, you know, the message that it might send. Even though it might be something I'm okay doing, I always have to think about the long-term effect. And I don't know if anyone's ever noticed, but you don't really ever see me with, you know, showing too much or having too much cleavage out. And a lot of people might assume it's because I'm Muslim. I'm not. It's just that I don't like for young girls to feel like you have to pose nude or you have to do certain things, you know, and, and at the same time, there's some women that do it and I don't judge them for that. You know, maybe they, they choose to do that, but that's not who I am and that's not the image that I want to send, you know. So uh, here we are. Now, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. I had so much I wanted to say. I was just like, right. I, mm. no, no. And, and actually, there's some really great nuggets of things I'd love to pursue, but the Women's Sports Foundation and being the president. Okay, yeah. So now, <laughs> so now you, um, you've got this, I was at the dinner, and you're speaking, and you're the face of women's sports. You're no longer the boxer. You've now graduated to this, this global role. Did, did, I guess the question was your experience and how then you were able to say, hey, you know, if, there's, if the field hockey people came to you or if someone, can you maybe give us, if, if there were moments, maybe not, of where you gave advice or you were in mm -hmm. meetings or you could see sports starting to emerge, which we see in the Olympics all the mm -hmm. time. Obviously, we see the NCAA women's basketball. Yes. And now this is your entire uh, landscape that yes. you are involved with for a couple of years. So when Billie Jean first approached me about being the president of the foundation, I was reluctant um, and hesitant because I was like, wow, you know, I didn't even grow up playing sports. Um, and there's so much there as far as just the organized sports and the collegiate sports and all these things. And I just never played it. And there's just this whole vocabulary that goes along with it. I can't even really have the conversation. Um, so I, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm the one. And she's like, no, you are the one because you're, you're that person. You know, we want to get more girls involved in sports. And you're someone who's saying that I regret that I didn't play sports. And you see the importance of it and how it could have you know, um, enrich my life, right? Um, so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And of course, then being around all these different women and sitting in board meetings and listening to all the issues is really overwhelming. Um, but the fact that we're in a time when we still see all the disparities, right? 
um, then that means that we need strong women that can stand up and can say something and can inspire others, right? So it doesn't really matter what I did and didn't do as long as I can have that conversation with people. So yes, now um, I'm an advocate for sports, even though I didn't play it growing up. You know, I'm like, no, my kids are going to play sports. I want it's confidence, you know, the confidence building, the, just the, the, what you learn about yourself, the discipline, working as a team, all these things you learn in sports that you can apply to so many different areas of your life. All of these successful women that I've met that said they, they believe that a, a large part of their success is because they played sports. You learn so much about yourself and about the world through sports. And as, um, you know, we, we've been talking about, um, and I know you guys have been talking about the importance of it and how it kind of... Um, plays into um, society in so many different ways and all of that, and it's true, and I've seen that myself. So that's why um, I think Billy asked me to be a president of the foundation, and I think I will always be involved with the women's sport, because once you get in, you don't get out, you know, you know. <laughs> once you get in, so. Right, it's like the Hotel California. Right, right. <laughs> the, we, here we are, the 45th uh, anniversary of Title IX uh, in a couple months, and so many good things, as you mentioned. Um, and, uh, but what you touched on a few moments ago about like, the way you handle yourself and the way you dress, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because there, you talk to some young athletes who maybe appear in the ESPN body issue, uh, or even the you know, Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, which tends to be almost all female, where the ESPN body issue mm -hmm. is actually male and female, which I think is better. But they're like, hey, no problem, right? And I'm reminded of back in Jenny Thompson, the great Olympic swimmer who posed topless with her arms like this or whatever in, in Sports Illustrated. And I asked Donna De Verona, the great Donna De Verona, Olympic gold medalist. And she said, I kind of like it when they keep their clothes on. <laughs> and so, you know, there's kind of like that old school feeling, right? But we also want to understand that these women believe it's a sense of freedom, even if us old people, not you, me, um, would go, wait a minute, you're playing to the lowest common denominator, right, which is the male gaze, or you're playing to that male-dominated sports you know, world. So when you talk to a young person, I mean, I assume you do s some mentoring, and, and, and you know, do you find that they're very, young girls are receptive to this, they want to hear what you have to say, or they're kind of like, hey, that's great, but I'm going to do my own thing, and if I'm sleeveless every day of the year and, and wearing almost no clothes, no problem. And how do we kind of make sense of that, do you think? You know, everyone has a right to make their own decision. I just try to offer them a different alternative. Um, I think that you can, I mean, you naturally as a woman want to be, you want people to say, oh, you're pretty, or, you know, and sometimes people will go to different lengths in order to get that response. They want to sometimes show their body in, in a magazine and be nude so people go, oh my God, did you see her? And maybe something else will come from that. Or maybe they have people around them, like their agents, that are like, no, you can do it, you're an athlete, this athletic thing. So it just really depends on you know, whether or not you can do it and sleep at night. And that for me, that's not something that I ever wanted to do because I feel like you can be just as strong and you can be beautiful and you can be powerful with your clothes on. I don't, and, but some people feel like they want to make a statement by taking their clothes off, you know, to each their own. But with the young girls, I try to, um, just, I think that if you love yourself and you have confidence in yourself and you know what your values are, then it'll be easier to make those decisions when, they're, when you're faced with them. Because there, there is going to come a time when you're going to have to decide. So. Right. And, and you think about, for example, Brandi Chastain with the winning penalty kick in 99 and she takes off her shirt and, and twirls it over her head, right? An iconic moment. And you see her abs and how, how cut she is, right? And then people are saying, oh, well, that was this sign of sex, or whatever that was. And then the flip side is, well, there were probably millions of women that exact day on the beach, it was July 10th of 1999, women uh, throughout the country on the beach with less on than Brandy had at that moment, right? So these conversations, I think, are with us probably forever. Um, and I didn't have a problem with that. I mean, she just took off her shirt. She had a sports bra underneath. You know, it was just a moment. I don't think she really thought that through. Like, I'm going to take off my shirt, show how sexy I am. You know, no, a, lot of times, exactly. a lot of times, you know, male athletes will take off their shirt you know, well, and, and they can, but she happened to have on a sports bar. So that was a little, you know, different. Well, and she was a big soccer fan, as she explained for anyone who hasn't followed this thing since I 
open this up. She watched men's soccer, and when they score a big goal, they take their shirt off, and they, so she said, right. why not? And that's right. what she did, too. And that was a pretty big goal, I think we can uh, safely say. <laughs> cover of Time, Newsweek, People, and Sports Illustrated. No story in the history of stories has ever been on the cover of Time, Newsweek. Not even your dad has been on the cover really? of Time, Newsweek, People, and Sports Illustrated. Well, I don't think people existed maybe <laughs> when he was doing his thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's my story. I'm sticking with it. But, um, but that, that's how big a deal that wow. was. Yeah. Do, do you know you know some you know Julie Fowdy, you know some of those guys, right? The yeah, I've soccer met them. team. Yeah. yeah. I actually competed against Brandy and Chopped cooking competition. <laughs> and who who won? I won. <laughs> she wasn't the only one. There was like a, I think it started up four people or something like that. Anyone who wants to tweet out, <laughs> hey Brandy Chastain, you you just lost. She was so good though. She really was, and she made a minor mistake. And no, seriously, <laughs> she made a minor mistake. She hurt, no, in her defense, because I thought it was going to be her and I in the finals. And she burned herself. And I think that got her so flustered that she forgot to put her sauce or something on. If you don't watch Chopped, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But she left out an ingredient, and that automatically would get you out. But she could have she won it. Like, I was, I was watching her like, OK, I got to watch her, because she, she was doing her thing. You know, on my notes here, I didn't have chopped. As, as, um, as, but, but what you just said. So here we are, and we're talking about you, and we're talking about Brandy, and we're talking about crossing over into our culture, and we all know exactly what we're talking about, right? And a generation ago, it was Billie Jean or Chris Everett, or maybe two generation and a half, right? But there are so many women now who we have, like a house, household name, Mia Hamm, uh, how about you know women's hoops, uh, the, the entire women's Olympic basketball team, Maya Moore, you know on and mm -hmm. on and on it goes. I mean, I, I, I'm bullish about where women's sports is. I mean, it's this interesting time in our country. You may have heard there was an election. <laughs> you know, where do women stand? But I, I'm really, I think the glass is half full, and I'm very positive. Are you? I am. Yes, um, especially when we're talking about women's sports. I just love that we see women in every sport now pretty much, um, and I love that my son is growing up where he can see women boxing, he can see women in the UFC, you know, he can see women wrestling, he can see women playing football, he's out there on the field playing soccer with girls, my daughter is on his baseball team right now, so just that they're going to open up their mind and not think, and that's where it starts with us just at a very young age where we've been conditioned to think a certain way, and that there's the possibilities that are there. So I think that um, you know this newer generation of of kids will grow up thinking different. So. Well, what you're describing is the ti you're you're raising not only a Title IX female but a Title IX male. Yes, definitely. And I don't know if many of you thought about this, but you think of these young men at this certain age. And for example, the USA we talked about it at lunch. USA women's hockey, the big battle they just had, and the major victory that they had in terms of wages. Well, who jumped in right away? But the NHL players. Right? And Major League Baseball. And we're talking about men and women in their 20s, right? Mm -hmm. Basically. So they're born in the 90s, right? So those Major League Baseball players were exactly like your son, right? On watching their sisters cheering for them. Or the ne girl next door, they were playing sports. Right. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I think this is such an underreported, kind of under the radar piece of our culture. That that we we don't I don't talk about in my columns. I mean, do you feel like we're maybe missing it? Is a some of these issues that it just isn't quite as popular as talking about whatever else is going on in the world? I hadn't thought of that question, um, but now that you ask me, um, yes, I think it needs to be um, covered more. Mm -hmm. So um, so maybe we need to start that conversation. Yeah. Keep it going. What else do we need to cover more? Is I I'm looking for a column idea for next week. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just gave you one. Take right. that one. I know exactly. No, no, no. And we said, you know, but but we said we wanted to have a conversation here. And by the way, we've got about 15 minutes or so, and then we definitely want to take your questions. So that is the most important thing. And we can actually even go to questions sooner if we if we want. Um, if you're sick of my questions, we can go no, on. No, I there. like your yeah. question. But um, uh, but you know, I, I'm, one thing that I have fun thinking about, and so I'll I'll kind of start the conversation. What's it all going to look like in 50 years or 100 years? Where will women be? Where were the, you know, the 10-year-old girl today? Or how old's your daughter? My daughter just turned six a couple days there ago. There you go. Your six-year-old daughter, when she is 46, 40 years from now, what does this world look like? There's no wrong answer, obviously. We have no idea. But, but the, the, and the, and the, the, your son and, what, and that world that he's in, I mean, 
do we have you know, 50 women in the Senate, hopefully? Uh, do, have we had woman president after woman president after woman president you know, in the 30s and 40s and onward? You know what I'm saying? And I think the lowest, com the, the, the thing that will be the, the tie between all of these successful women will be because they played sports because of Title IX. Definitely, I think it's, it will definitely be a big, um, I mean, <clears throat> I'm sorry, playing sports will definitely have a big impact on uh, the success of individuals in the future. And I just know that with my daughter, I'm raising her to um, believe she can do anything that she wants to do. Um, she's super feisty, super, and I like it. Like that to me is like a positive word in my house. <laughs> um, she like has her own mind. Now it's, it, it's a struggle for me, don't get me wrong, but I always have to remind myself, okay, this is good. I just have to shape her and mold her um, because Sydney is like, <laughs> you know, everything is like, I'm gonna do what I wanna do when I wanna do it. Um, and she doesn't have any limits on herself. She says, mom, I came out of your boxing belly. You know, she's like doing this and I'm like, I told you, I don't want my daughter to, to um, become a fighter per se, um, just because of the business of boxing. Like I mentioned, I wish that I would have played sports earlier because I think I would have been out there with Venus and Serena or out there on the soccer field, you know, um, in the Olympics. And I didn't even have the opportunity to go to the Olympics because boxing was not, female boxing was not an Olympic sport. So men's boxing was, my father got to, you know, go to the Olympics, but I didn't. So it now is, and there's a young girl named Clarissa Shields mm -hmm. who won gold. Um, and she... I think twice. Yeah, twice. One, yeah, 12 back and, to back. and 16. Mm -hmm. yep. Isn't a movie being made about her life, I think? I know there was a documentary made yeah. on her um, already, but I don't know if they're doing a movie. But um, she's turned pro since yeah. then, so I love just watching her. She's actually in the weight class that I was in. So um, I love uh, watching her and just watching how her career is unfolding, and I've tried to give her some advice along the way. Um, but for me, um, my daughter, like I said, I want her to play sports and get everything that she needs out of it. And if she decides that she wants to be a professional athlete, great. Because I think as parents, um, you know, you have to be careful not to push your kids in a certain direction. You know, I, I want them to be open to do whatever it is that's gonna make them happy in life, you know? So I'm gonna encourage them to find that thing. Um, and yes, we're gonna play sports and you have to participate, but you don't necessarily have to become a professional athlete, right? It's just what you take from sports that um, can help you in so many different areas of your life. Now she, you're both your kids got to know their grandfather. Oh yeah. Right? And, they knew, but they didn't really understand. Just like when I was a kid, people always asked me, when did you first learn how great your father was or why people loved him? And I can't even really remember the moment, but when I was eight or nine, you don't really understand. You understand people are coming up to you, everywhere you go there's a crowd, it's kind of annoying because you're standing around waiting for a couple hours, you know, you get stuck everywhere. You know, you, I never wanted to go anywhere with my dad because I knew, like, we'd be, he loved doing magic tricks and drawing in a crowd. So you're <laughs> going to be there for two or three hours watching those same magic tricks. Um, so. <laughs> Did you ever figure out the magic tricks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. He had this one where he would, <laughs> he would pretend that this, uh, uh, what was it, the um, handkerchief would disappear. So he had a plastic thumb, okay? So he'd have the thumb and he'd say, here's the handkerchief, right? And, and then he'd kind of take the thumb off and stuff the handkerchief into the thumb and then put it back on. So I saw that and he'd say, whoa, you know, and then as he got older <laughs> and got sick, the thumb would be the wrong color. Like he would have <laughs> like a white person's thumb on his right hand. We'd be like, dad, you know, people could see it, but they were still, you know, oh, okay. Then he had this levitating one that he did where he'd act like he was floating and he's really was just on his front toe. So like I knew all of them. Like, <laughs> So we were just like, oh, you know, as a, as a child, you're just like, oh, this is so corny, you know, but he would also pass out his pamphlets, and he was still, like, he have, you know, about Islam, so he, he would write his signature on him. He spent hours writing his signature so that he could pass them out to people as he met people. So I saw this all the time, but, um, and, and, and I get it now, but as a kid, you know, I didn't, I didn't ever want to go with him, so I forget the question again. Yeah, well, it, it was about, about the kids and, yeah. and looking up to him. The, of course, you lost your dad. Oh, I meant, this is what I was gonna yep. say, I'm sorry. Sure. So my kids knew, but and, and it wasn't until he passed away that they really got the opportunity to see, because now you know they're showing all these specials on my father on television. They went to, um, we went to his memorial service and they saw all these different people come from all, it was very overwhelming for them. 
And then they went to the Muhammad Ali Center for the first time. And really, my son is older. He's eight now. And he's, he's really, really bright and smart. And he was able to just kind of watch the videos and see the timeline. And I was even amazed because I know my dad. And I'm, I'm not a Muhammad Ali fan. So I haven't read all of his books, of the books written about him and all that. But to be at the Ali Center and just see this long wall, this timeline of all of these important dates and all of the things that he's done in his life, just because I never, you know, took the time to really go through. It was amazing to me, and for them to see that and um, see all those wonderful people get on the stage and talk about him, then I, I could tell that's when they started to kind of get it. And um, my daughter had this really special connection, like a spiritual connection with my father ever, ever since she was a baby. Um, my father doesn't, didn't really speak that much anymore, and um, you know, towards the end he was in a hospital bed, he was on a um, you know, feeding tube and all of that. And my daughter, most people or kids are afraid, we're afraid because he's shaking, he's got really big hands. And my daughter, since she was a baby, would just go right out to him, hug him, you know, and she'd kiss him, and then she'd just kind of get into the bed with him. And, you know, she'd run back and forth. Like every five minutes, she'd go back and visit him and kiss him, and his eyes would just light up because he's so, he loves kids, he loves giving kisses, and for her not to be afraid of him. And um, so it was, it was amazing. It was, it was amazing to see the connection they had. So that has been the hardest thing for me is Sydney. Because she doesn't understand. She says, well, why did Papa have to leave? Why did he have to go to heaven? You know, why? I miss, she talks about him still, like, at least twice a week. Mm -hmm. So she knows, um, but she doesn't really understand why. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, as they get older, when they really understand and hear the stories of, you know, who he was as a human being. And I think they're going to be even, even more proud. But my son looks just like him. So my son opened a book the other day and was like, that looks like me. I'm like, I know. So <laughs> when he was 12, as we've been telling you, you look just like your grandfather. And I love it because, you know, I'm the youngest. My, my dad has 13 grandkids, but my child is the only one that looks like him. So I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good work. Good work Thank on that. You. <laughs> when we were talking and, and chatting about what we wanted to talk about, I mentioned the 1996 Olympics. And... Um, I think because for so many of us, it, it is that iconic moment for your dad. Those of us who didn't really know him in his prime, obviously. Um, I remember those, those Ali Frazier fights, but I was little <laughs> and you weren't born yet. But I was at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, and I'm sure all of you remember this moment. But no one knew who was going to light the torch. And this is a U.S. Olympics, so you figure it's going to be a U.S. athlete. And lots of names were thrown out, but I don't even remember your dad's name being thrown out that much. I mean, it, you know, whatever, Michael Jordan, right? All kinds of names, right? So now comes the moment, and I, I want to, I'll set it up, but I want to hear what you, you were thinking. So now we're in the stadium, opening ceremonies, 80,000 people, it's dark, and the torch is going around, and Janet Evans, of course you remember Janet Evans, uh, the Olympic swimmer. Now she's taking it up to the, near the, the where you're going to light the cauldron, and we're thinking, well, it's Janet Evans, which is not insignificant and would have been very well deserved. Uh, Olympic gold medalist and, and a, a great Olympic champion, a great athlete. Um, and then out of the darkness emerges your dad. And I will, my last words on this, because this is all your story. My last words though, as I'm a journalist sitting there and we're all there, I have never heard 80,000 people gasp in unison and it wasn't just me. Bob Costas and I were talking recently because he's for a column about him. And I said, what's your favorite Olympic moment? He's covered a lot of them, as I have. Muhammad Ali lighting the torch is his favorite moment. And he said the same exact thing, that audible gasp of like the air being sucked out of this outdoor stadium as Muhammad Ali emerged to light the torch. It was, it was the same for me. I mean, we, they you kept did not us, know, No, we right? didn't know. Our, our whole family didn't know. They kept us such a secret. You know how it is if you tell one person it might get to the other person, our family's so big. So yeah, we didn't even know. So for me, I was, I mean, I'm so, I was so proud of my dad. Um, and it just really brought tears to my eyes. And just you were because in the, you were not I was the not there. No, I wasn't there. I was watching on television and I didn't know. So luckily I saw it and caught it, you know, but um, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you How funny would that moments. have been? Like, if someone calls you and says, hey, were you watching TV? Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. So, um, and that's me. I'm that person that would miss something. So, um, so I, it really just brought tears to my eyes because my father's never, you know, hid the fact that he's sick. He's always, he said that boxing was going to be his platform to do his humanitarian work. And, you know, we already know that 
he had an ego and he was conceited and he had a lot of pride and all those things, but not so much that he wouldn't get out and, and you know, be a symbol for other people who had you know, illnesses. And he was still standing there strong, even with his hand shaking. And so I was just proud of him, you know, because he, he was like, he's such a sweetie pie. Like if you, he's just, when you, that's the first thing I think of when I think about my father outside of just who he is as a man, as an athlete, is just how sweet and gentle he is as a person. Um, so it just brought tears to my eyes. I mean, I don't really have a big story other than that. I mean, no, that's a good one. That's one of the best and, and will be, of course, iconic. And the video is iconic. And we saw it, of course, so often when he passed away. And, and of course, our condolences to you and Thank your family you. Uh, on that. You know, um, why don't we, should we start the questions? You want to do why that? Not? Is sure. that all right? Sure. We've, we've got, I believe we've got the microphone here in the middle, right? We'd love to hear your questions. And Fire White, why don't you tell us who you are and, and then ask your question. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Sammy Nagy Chow. I'm a master's student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I have a real interest in um, developing positive body images in my students, um, whether I'm coaching them or teaching. Uh, so I just wanted to get any sort of thoughts that you have on developing positive body images um, in all genders and especially challenging a lot of aesthetic sports ideal body images? Uh. Well, for me, um, I, I don't have the ideal body, you would think, as far as a lot of um, women are concerned uh, in general, because I'm a big girl. You know, a lot of times we're concerned about our weight and our size and all that. I weighed 168 pounds when I was fighting. I weigh 190 pounds right now. So that's the first thing a lot of people are surprised at. And I have no problem saying it, right? Because that's, that's one thing that I do is just, I talk about it openly just for people to see that it doesn't really matter how much you weigh, it's really about how you feel, right? And I try to focus more on being healthy opposed to being a certain size and, you know, with, with eating right, with um, working out comes the benefit of looking good, right? So when you focus on that, then everything else kind of falls into place. And I think it really just comes down to understanding that, you know, we're all special, we're all unique, um, and that God created us exactly the way that we're supposed to be. That's the first foundation that you have to have and stop looking at others and wishing you had what they had because nobody's perfect. Right? A lot of people may look at me and think, oh, you know, you're so this, you're so that. And I'm like, I can tell you, look, there are things that if I could change, like the fact that I wear size 12 shoe, <laughs> that right there, I don't really care that my feet are a size 12. The problem with it is it's hard to find shoes. <laughs> so I have to order shoes online, right? And I'm like, ah, so that's the thing. But it's not because it's like, oh, I'm embarrassed because my feet are big. They fit my body, you know? And, and when I was younger, I was like, why are my hands so big? I got big hands, you know? And, I, it's hard for me to find jewelry. But then when I started knocking people out, I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why. So like I said, it's just, you know, everything's the way that it is for a reason, you know, and, but I, again, I don't have the perfect answer for you, but I think that with a lot of girls, they need to understand when you see certain images, people are airbrushed, you know, it's not, they're not even the way they look like they are a lot of the time. But even for that person you see in front of your eyes, you're like, okay, she's not airbrushed and she looks perfect to me. It's like, you, can't, you gotta just you know, accept what you have, work with what you have, and focus on the things that are important. And it's just a message that we just have to instill in people on an ongoing basis. But for me in my life, I focus on health and wellness through nutrition and working out. And you know, I, say, I say, build it, don't buy it, period. <laughs> well, Thank also, you. <laughs> just as, yeah, I'm for that. How important is Serena Williams in this conversation? Because again, the greatest, I think one of the greatest athletes, male or female sure. in the United States and the world, but also I think the greatest female athlete in any sport. I mean, if we have to add the word adjective female to any of this conversation. But again, the size where what would have been said, and she did deal with a lot, yeah, right? Yeah. But the, isn't it great that that five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old girl or boy sees that as the sportsman of the year, sports person of the year, right? Yeah, isn't definitely. that exactly what you're talking about? Yeah, and her body is the way that it is for a reason. Look what she was born to do, right. you know? And not that everyone has to aspire to want to be that way or not. Um, I would have loved to go against her because, you know, we're both big, strong girls. That's why I said <laughs> I'd have had something for him if I would have been playing tennis. But, <laughs> but um, I'm just playing. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I think it's great. I think it's great. And I think that I love her confidence in herself. Um, I love that she's able to um, be comfortable in her own skin. Mm -hmm. 
so regardless of what other people what other people think about her body, and that's that's what's important. That's what I admire when I see, you know, other women who um, just love themselves regardless. So, but it's hard when you're on that platform and everybody's judging you. I have people now say about me. I mean, they're like, listen to her voice. She sounds like she has such a deep voice. She sounds like a man, or maybe she took steroids. And I'm like. Say that to my face, and I'm just joking. <laughs> well, thank you very play. much. <laughs> Go on. Thank you. Thanks for the question. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amory. I'm a freshman at Nichols College. I was wondering, what was it like for you when you realized that you were a role model to so many people? And like, was there a time where you just you were like, oh my goodness, like there's so many people that look for look at me. I knew, thank you, I knew growing up, uh, I knew before I started boxing that I would be a role model because just, just with my father being who, is, I un who he is, I understood that. Um, and I never wanted to be a public person. Um, so that was one of the things that I had to deal with when I decided that I wanted to box. A lot of just because I grew up around it. Um, you know, some people want to be famous, right? They like, I want to be famous. I want people to recognize me. I, I really don't like being recognized. I'm a private person. I'd rather just not get any attention. But um, for me, so I had to deal with it. And I said, I got to follow my heart and do what I love. And I wasn't really worried about the role model side. I get asked that question a lot. Should athletes be role models? Like, you naturally are a role model whether you want to be or not. Um, but you know, luckily, thank God, I'm a person that I'm, I'm going to do what's right for the sake of doing what's right, not because I have to be a role model. So it takes the burden off of me as well. I don't have to worry about that. But like I said, I do make certain decisions based on the fact that I know people look up to me. And I always remember myself seeing women's boxing for the first time and how that changed my life. You know, So someone might see me for the first time and, and it might encourage them to do something in their life. So um, that's pretty much it. I've, it's, it's been really natural for me and I think that um, you know, it's not the same for everyone because some people say, I don't want to be a role model to your kids just because I'm a basketball player, right? But that's just not the way that it is. You are a role model regardless, so. Thank you. Did By I answer way, your question? That somebody, Charles Barkley, <laughs> has admitted that he is, in fact, a role model. Oh, good. Yeah, I got good. it. You know, we had to, like, hold him down and tickle him. But oh, right. He, <laughs> but he did. I, I like that you mentioned that. Yeah, okay. Hello. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. How you guys doing today? Good, thank My you. My name is Mike. I'm better known as president. I'm a 2008 graduate of the college, and I studied government here. And these days, artist, entrepreneur, and recently launched a diverse ventures fund to invest in women and minority-led businesses in marginalized areas. My first question would be, what specific areas of the economy of the sports world do you think would have the greatest macroeconomic impact? And I, and I asked that just watching uh, Warren Buffett's documentary where he said that 50% of our economy, effectively women, are being underutilized from a macroeconomic stance. So given that sports is such an important part of our culture, of our doctrine, where specifically can we put capital to have the greatest impact? Oh, brother, that's just too deep for me. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I got a thought. You just wore me out with that question. All right. Back it up, back it up. Look, I went to Santa Monica College, OK? No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Did you, did you get all that? Well, I, I, I actually have an idea for you. Um, for you, but, but okay. what, did you have a second part first? No, go, my go second ahead. part was, what does balance mean to you? What was, what? What does what balance mean to you? Balance? What, balance. Exactly. I like that question. Uh, <laughs> something for everybody. She'll Come on now. the second part first. <laughs> go ahead. Balance for me um, changes from time to time, but right now, balance for me is, you know, I think of myself as a mother first, right? A woman, a wife, uh, a businesswoman, an athlete, you know, and then I have my spiritual self that I'm thinking about. So just right, trying to balance all of those things. So for me, um, it's just about being the best mom that I can be, being the best um, businesswoman I can be, doing everything. Like, I, I have this thing about, like, I want to be a superwoman, right. but a lot of times, you know, you fall short in certain areas. So for me, it's really about keeping my priorities in order. Um, really being consistent about um, a, having a clear idea. Like every day I wake up and it's like, th these are my goals for the day. My lo long term, my short term goals and then really checking myself and making sure that I stay on top of that because otherwise life happens. People are pulling you from every which direction. You know? And for me, it's like opportunities come up where you know, we, we, we want to give back. As, as an athlete, as a public person, but then sometimes you get so caught up giving back that you don't focus on your own personal goals. For sure. So for me, like I said, balance really is about just being consistent 
um, and staying on top by writing things down. You know, I have affirmations that I say. I meditate. I, you know, I have my short-term and long-term goals, and just kind of checking back, checking in with that every single day. So, but as far as that other question, well, okay. But here, I got an idea. <laughs> I got an idea. When you said the part about... He's just so tickled. I like watching you. You're so tickled. <laughs> you were talking about the underutilization of women and right. women as, as a power, a economic force. Exactly. And so women's sports. And one of the thoughts I have, and maybe you can play off this or not, is so when you see all these shows, and maybe it is even women who are scantily clad, uh, which obviously I do a lot of mentoring and I really try to encourage people to have longevity, which means if you're 25, can they replace you with a 30-year-old? But if you are got more than, you know, if you're relying on your brains and your talent, you'll hopefully be doing this into your 40s and 50s. So there's that piece of it. But if they are, if it's like ESPN, not to pick on ESPN at all, because they have a ton of women on air, but playing to the frat house, right? Uh, be it in hiring practices or just what they're doing, aren't they missing this incredible demographic of the 12-year-old girl on the couch right. watching sports with her mom or dad or her siblings. That 12-year-old girl, again, you can see my, my brain is always moving ahead tw in terms of the future. 12-year-old girl, when she's 32 and making all the buying decisions for the house, whether right. it's single person or married or whatever. And that, I think, is where the mainstream sports media has fallen terribly, not realizing that the frat house is going to buy the beer but that 12-year-old girl is going to be a consumer of sports for the rest of her life, right? Because right? she's played sports like your daughter, like you, um, like I did even back in the days of Rutherford B. Hayes. And, <laughs> and, but that they, she will be not only loving sports, but a consumer. And I know this is a huge tenant of the Women's Sports Foundation, is it not? Definitely. I think we just, we just need to see more women over, over all areas of media and television. I, I co-host a show called um, We Need to Talk. It's an all-female sports commentary show. And I work with so many talented women, journalists and also other athletes. And it's just like any other show. Great show. Talk. If you haven't seen it, Leslie Visser, yeah. of course, dear friend yeah. of mine. So oh, many. yeah. Yeah, right. yeah so, it's uh, CBS Sports Network. Mm -hmm. CBS Sports Network, and it's called We Need to Talk. But yeah. that's the type of show that I want to see. And, and we have a female producer and director, oh, and it's, it's, it's a great show. Um, so I think that has been a start, and it's been wonderful, and it's been, um, you know, getting a lot of positive feedback. But I think that just infusing more women into every, uh, every area <laughs> of everything right. is always going to make it better. So. Well, and Billie Jean King, again, who we've mentioned before, has always said we've got to have women making the decisions at the top of these companies and the top of these networks so that then they're hiring more women and it all starts to balance out. So that's our answer. Certainly. That's all we got. Thank you guys, thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. And I just wanted to add, I didn't know too much about my dad. He passed when I was growing up, when I was very young, but I was watching Facing Ali and I saw him in there and I saw that he was doing security with your father and I found a lot of my purpose oh, wow. in it. So thank you for being here, just allowing me to even heal and grow into a, a better person, just in this whole interaction. Appreciate thank you, you so guys much. so much, wow. thank you. Thank you, it's, it's a, great a small world. Thank you. That's really cool. Cool, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Perrin Grayson, and I'm a graduate of uh, Radcliffe College. And when I was here, I had the chance to hear your father. He came to speak, and he was brilliant, read his poetry, and it's a, a very special memory. So, but I had a question. I would be fascinated to hear what was involved in training to become a boxer, because I have yes. very little idea. Yes, I'll tell you. <laughs> So before I started boxing, like I said, I didn't play sports. I wasn't in shape at all. I was like any other person. I, I shouldn't say any other person, but I was like most young kids. I ate what I wanted to eat. I didn't have a gym membership or anything. At that time, I was about 17 and a half. Um, so I went down to the boxing gym, got with a trainer, and they said, well, you got to come to the gym six days a week, OK? So and what I would do when I got to the gym is I would hit the heavy bag. You know what a heavy bag is? Mm -hmm. I would hit the speed bag, there's a double in bag that you work on your eyes, jump roping, then of course you do your sit-ups and you do all of that kind of stuff and then you work with your trainer on your footwork in the ring. Every fighter is different I'll say but those are the basics um, and you really have to 
take the time to assess you know, what your strengths are as a fighter. So naturally, if you're tall and you have a long reach, you're going to work on keeping somebody on the outside because you, know, you can hit them, but they can't hit you. They have shorter arms. Um, but that's not as easy as it sounds, right? Um, and then for me, um, I, did, I had to start running. I had to start because I never ran. And you have to do your road work as a fighter because boxing is one of the hardest sports when it comes to endurance. Um, because again, you're, you, you might be getting beat up, you know, and you still have to keep going. Um, and that takes a lot of strength in a lot of different areas of your body, not only mentally, but physically as well. So learning how to run, I think, was probably um, one, of the, um, one of the things I was most proud you, of. How far would you run? I started off walk running, okay? <laughs> and it's funny, because my mom is, has always been very fit, and she taught me how to run. So we went out and we ran, and she said, okay, we're gonna run you know, for a minute, and then we're gonna walk for two minutes. We're gonna run for a minute, and I kind of worked my way up. And that's what I tell people now that say they don't know how to run. I didn't know how to run either. So I had to teach myself, and then I worked my way up to like four miles, because depending on you know, how many rounds you're fighting, um, when you first start fighting, your first fight would be four rounds. So for me, f running four miles was enough. You know, some, some fighters might say they'll run eight miles, but you don't really need to, um, depending on you know, what your style of fighting is. But that's it. And then just every day doing that back to back, working your way up, a lot of shadow boxing, just being in the mirror, um, pretending there's someone in front of you and they're throwing a certain shot and you're getting out of the way of it. And then, then eventually you start sparring, which is when you actually get in the ring and box with other fighters. So and that's always an interesting experience to start doing that because you're getting good beat up a little bit the first time. Um, and uh, you know, I only box with men for the most part. Like when I first started boxing, I boxed with some women, but it was hard to find, it's harder to find girls who are tall enough and, and weigh enough, because boxing's all by weight class. And if you box with a man, you gotta find a man who's lighter and who knows how to work with you, who's not gonna be hitting you as hard as he possibly can, because a man is always gonna be stronger than a woman. So, I mean, most men anyway. But um, <laughs> I've had some that weren't, you know, but anyway, it was fun. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, that, that's pretty much it. But it's just, you have to understand the, the pain that your body goes through. Um, not just from being, I'm not talking about being hit, just the next day is when you really feel it, when you're sore from, 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 from being hit. And then you have to get in there and do it again, day after day after day. So, um, and it's really a mental, you have to be strong mentally as well um, to get in there. Because if you are getting hit and you keep getting hit with the same shot and you're in the, you're in the round and you can't figure out why, you know, sometimes I would get so mad sometimes I'll just cry. You know, I, I wouldn't be like, ooh, but I'd have tears because I'd be so mad, like, trying to figure out what I was doing wrong, you know, and, um, but I would still keep fighting. I'd be crying and fight. People thought I was crazy lots of times in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I may be crying, but I'm going to keep fighting. So, yeah, but it, it, was, it was a grueling workout. Sounds Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Hi, I'm Sami Saïd from the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And thank you very much for coming. And what would be the most ins uh, inspirational quote from your father you will always remember? I think, um, and I'm going to paraphrase it, uh, service on, on earth is the rent that I pay in heaven, for my space in heaven. So basically, he's, yeah. he, the service that he's doing now, he felt like was, was his, his, his way into heaven. And he believed that, by the way. Um, you know, which was interesting to me because my father was always, you know, he, he believed that, you know, you got to do more good than you do bad <laughs> um, to make it to heaven. And I'm just thinking like, wow, this man who's done so much and changed the world and inspired so many lives feel like, feels like he still has more good to do. I mean, as far as in terms of making it to heaven. But um, he really was all about just giving back to other people, you know, and um, he loved people. I've seen my father just over the years get what you would think taken advantage of by people, but he didn't care because if someone stole from him or something, he's like, well, he must have needed it more than I did. Hmm. And I'm just like, that's not how I think, you know? <laughs> so we're very different in that way, you know, but my father is just such a giving, loving person. And I grew up watching my father cry. I watched that and that, that for me um, made a big difference in who I was as an, an individual because seeing a man as strong as Muhammad Ali in those moments when he's crying, not because he felt bad, but just even out of joy, you know, or because he was sad and he was very sensitive and wasn't afraid to show his feelings. So, there, you know, when I said he was a male chauvinist in a certain way, not in that way, though. Um, so that was something that I really loved and appreciated about my father. So, yes, he was all about service to others. Yeah. 
And he has a quote. We gotta look up that that exact quote. Yeah, maybe someone's got their phone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you Thank you. It. And and I was thinking off of that question. You know, your dad is so associated with Howard Cosell. Mm -hmm. And Howard Cosell has been gone for a long time. But I'm curious, have you ever dealt with the Cosell family, or was there? You probably never met no. Howard Cosell. No. But all those interviews, right? You guys remember those? And and I'm so pretty, and you know all that back and forth. I mean. Your dad obviously would have been your dad without Howard Cosell, but yeah. I think Howard Cosell made him, uh, brought out. They had a fun relationship amazing, for sure, yeah. yeah, the two of them together. And there's uh, some great comments from those interviews too, if you want to look them up, I'm f for sure. Next question. Hi, my name's Ariel and I'm a senior at the college. And I was just wondering, this is kind of for both of you, um, how have you learned from your identity being an athlete and the things through practicing sport for your whole life onto your career, and how has that shaped the person that you are today and the professional decisions you've made? For me, um, boxing changed my life um, because there's lots of moments where you really have to, just being an athlete, you gotta dig deep, and that's when you really find out who you are. And naturally, as human beings, we, we put limits on ourselves. We think, oh, wait, I can't go any further, I can't push any harder, and then you're in a situation where you have to do it. You're like, oh, I did it. <laughs> you know. And I remember that moment when I thought that I couldn't, and then I remember that moment when I found out that I could, and then now, I can apply that to everything else, else in my life. And any time that I just think this is too hard, I'm not gonna be able to do it, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yes, you can. So that alone in itself is just that, that confidence that I have that I've proven to myself. If I've proven my, to myself one time, that means I can prove it to myself a million more times. So um, that is just the, the most basic thing I can tell you about how um, being an athlete has just um, changed my life um, in the way that I look at things. It doesn't mean that you know, you're not gonna have failures, it doesn't mean that things aren't gonna be hard, but just having the confidence and um, the self-belief to know that I can pretty much get through just about anything. Um, and I think that, that that is so important. People need confidence more than ever. So many people have good ideas and things that they wanna do, but then the fear holds them back. You know, um, and like I said, I can't speak to how, much, how, how sports Really, I mean, the women that I know that are athletes just have a, this level of confidence. You know, you can just see it, you can feel it, you can hear it, and they can apply it. So, um, I don't know. Well, and you think about this. For generations in this country, we were not allowing 50 or 51% of our population to learn these life lessons. What were we thinking? Uh, again, Title IX, signed by Richard Nixon, of all people, in June of 1972. But, and I graduated from high school in 76. So I was starting high school in 72, and so I really saw almost none of it. Grew up in the suburbs of Toledo, Ohio, and I was a sixth sport athlete in high school, and I, now you're thinking, oh, she's a great athlete. No, I was good enough, and I'm tall, and so I was able to play, and I was coordinated, but no one cared about girls' sports. Even my dad, who was my own personal Title IX playing baseball with me when I was growing up, um, but no one cared enough about girls' sports to want us to specialize. So I literally ran from first doubles on the tennis court to the field hockey match where I was the captain of the team, and then basketball, volleyball in the winter, and then softball and track and field in the spring. In my high school, 100% of the kids went to college, and every mom and dad wanted their daughter to be a doctor or a lawyer just like their son, except sports, to show how ingrained this was. No one even thought that we were mowing the field hockey field while the, our opponent was showing up, where this was a Tuesday, where the football field what would that be, you know, 72 hours away, was already in pristine shape. And yet the field hockey team was the one that was sending kids on to college and winning state, Ohio State championships, my, my high school did. And the football team has had like two boys be kickers in college, which is great, but <laughs> that was so ingrained. And so for me, in addition to just the pure love of all those sports, and to this day I play sports and love it, and it's just a lifetime thing, as I'm sure for most of you in this room. But I also think for me, it has informed every ounce of what I do as a journalist because I know what it was like to have it myself because of my parents encouraging it at a time when no one else was encouraging their daughter to play sports. And so I had that, but most women my age, mm, mm And so to fight for Title IX, to write those columns, to uh, ask the questions, as I just did at Augusta National about Donald Trump and women, uh, I will absolutely do that. Yeah, look it up. It's, it, you might, your computer might explode. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm going back tonight to drive them crazy. And, no. um, 
But anyway, but bottom line is that that's as a journalist, I to having seen this incredible change, it's fantastic, and it makes me smile and brings tears to my eyes to see what girls have now, and how wonderful the change has been in in a blink of an eye in our nation's history. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your Thank question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amanda Ortiz, and I'm a student athlete at the University of Massachusetts. Um, my question was regarding the inequality of women professional athletes, and I guess regarding basketball and soccer relatively. So, your thoughts and uh, personal experiences on that? I don't have any personal experience with it. Um, I know that the Women's Sports Foundation um, does a lot of work with collegiate sports and trying to make sure that the, the playing field is leveled um, as far as just dollars that are allocated to the girls, you know, and so that we have j the same amount of opportunities as, as the boys' teams do. Do you have any? any yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, I think we can declare victory with Title IX because of the participation piece of it, where literally, if a girl, if you see a girl in the airport, hey, what sport do you play, right? You never would have asked that question 40 right. years ago. So we're so, we, we've done so many good things. Obviously, the underserved areas and women coaching women is where we're really, and Mary Jo Kane has done a lot on this. Um, and uh, the Tucker Center, you guys, amazing work. Um, so there's a lot to do, go on that side. So it's not all, I said declare victory because I want to be positive, but there's a lot to do there. The professional side, in some ways, of course, that's business. Mm -hmm. And if people want to pay for it, Right? right? So while I think the WNBA is great, and for example in DC where Elena Deladon has now come to Washington, that is gonna be a very big deal in Washington. And they, the Mystics will do very well. Mm. But they're, the Wizards are so entrenched, of course they're not gonna overtake the Wizards. That sounds, it would be ridiculous to say that, right? And that's okay. Um, I think my, kind of, and we wanna make sure to get, we have a few minutes, wanna make sure to get to as many questions as possible. It's a long, books are written on this topic, and Mary Jo would be a great one to talk to. But I do think, um, that we judge women's sports by the male model. And if you listen to Shock Jock Screaming Radio, and like, oh, the WNBA isn't any good and whatever. Well, you know what, could we start baseball today if there was no baseball? Right. No, of course not. You know, a sport that never existed, and now corporations are gonna build stadiums to have baseball? No. So the bottom line is women's sports are coming into a chock full calendar of sports, and I think they're doing great. And in 100 years, will it be equal? Probably not, but maybe. Um, but there's also things like gymnastics where the women are the stars, figure skating where women are the stars, soccer where our women's team is certainly much more successful than our men's team. Mm -hmm. um, on and on it goes. And I think, again, you look for those moments. But I'm, I, there's a lot on that topic. And feel free to shoot me an email if you'd want at my mm -hmm. website. I'm happy to discuss it further Thank with you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharon Churbin. Um, I'm a sports psychologist in the area. And uh, there, I could go off in 10 different directions on some things that you've said, Layla. Um, one is that you were a late initiator in terms of becoming an athlete in your own mind. And I think there's an upside to that, which is you weren't necessarily shaped by that male model, which you just described. Um, and as women internalize like the values of sport that are still getting communicated primarily by male coaching. There is a humanity about you and the fact that you started later, you already had command of lots of parts of yourself. Um, and I think doing some, you know, you are a role model. So modeling that initiation as an athlete can occur all through the life cycle is actually a pretty big statement. Um, I worked with a powerlifter who started at 50 um, and, and competed at the um, national level, not age-weighted, like she competed mm -hmm. full strength at mm. 50 years old. Um, it's pretty compelling for people later in the life cycle to have models of later initiation and not to be necessarily apologetic about not having been an athlete, you know, in the developmental years and all of the upside that, that kids do get from being in the sports world. And then my other um, just question to you is, do you, do you speak to those groups, you know, to women who potentially haven't necessarily identified as an athlete, but are looking for ways to do that sort of midlife or throughout the life cycle? I haven't at, up until this point. No one's ever asked me to either. But um, I think that for me, being that boxing is just so different than other sports, 
Um, I was able to get into it late because of the level of, of, of um, women's boxing or just boxing in general. Right. Um, it's one of those sports, it's not organized. Anyone can be like, I wanna be a boxer. Anyone can say, I wanna be a promoter. And I don't really like the business side of boxing, but I just want, I always wanna put that in perspective because I can't, like now, I wouldn't have been able to just get in and just start playing. I could, but I'm saying like tennis or something like that because these people have, their skill level is so much greater because they started right. you know, sooner. So I wouldn't have been able to do that. And that's why I, like I said, say that I regret it. I'm not one of those people who wants to go back and go, I don't care if I'm 40, I'm gonna start playing tennis now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just like, I'm good. So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I'm good, next lifetime, you know. Yeah. So, but I, for all four people who want to do that though, but you definitely have to be passionate about it and you have to be prepared. I have other goals and dreams that I wanna attain because people ask me now, do I wanna come back and train fighters? Do I wanna come back and promote mm -hmm. fights? I'm like, that's not my interest. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I'm gonna apologize for either because the women's boxing community says, well, why don't you come back and do more for us? And I'm like, that's not my passion. I have a passion to, to really encourage people to be the best that they can be in life, whether they're an athlete or not. You know, So I'm not gonna just limit myself to just boxing. I mean, if I can just help and come in and get out, get in and get out, I can. You know, But to answer your question, I would be open to doing that. Anytime that I can say something that can help somebody else, that's what I wanna do. As far as like what I'm gonna make my focus, that comes down to what's in my heart. You know, But definitely, I mean, if, if you're asking me if I'd be interested, um, to speak, then yes, I would, definitely. Great. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. And you know what? I, we're going to do, we're going to go to overtime. We are we're actually out of time, but we've got, we're going to do a lightning round where we're going to do like literally okay. 30 seconds. Can you guys do All that? Right. Yep. Okay. I'm up. Diane Rosenfeld. I teach at the law school and run the gender violence program there. <clears throat> and thank you for coming. Thank and you. I wanted to bring your dad into the room. I got, I had the honor of meeting him mm. in 94. Oh, and, nice. Can um, you bring it up? Yeah, absolutely. I'll bring it up. Oh, after second. you say what you say. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and what really struck me about him that is living through you is he had so much grace. And I see that in you. And, oh, and thank, thank you for you. all your amazing work. Thank you. And inspiration. Appreciate that. That's lovely. Um, and my very quick thank question you. is I pay a lot of attention to gender equality in sports and eliminating sexual harassment and sexual assault and that angle of Title IX. And I'm wondering what you think about gender inclusive sports as a way to, to address the sexism that exists in sports. That, that if kids grew up playing with each other and it wasn't like a boys team and a girls team. Your kids are now, right? Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, your daughter's playing on your son's. Yeah, my, my daughter, team. yeah, my, my daughter. So she plays on my son's We're gonna keep um, this to 30 baseball seconds. team. Yeah, I know. So I see <laughs> on the field, okay, like my son plays soccer, I see girls' teams, which is great, and I see yeah. some teams where the girls are playing with the boys, and I think that's wonderful. I think as long as it's not a sport where power is gonna come into play, mm -hmm. like a lot of times people say, well, would you ever wanna fight a man? I'm like, no, because I wanna win. You know, I'm not going to <laughs> fight a man. Not that I could, not that my skill level is in the high, but the thing is, I, I punch harder than a lot of men, but they can take it and I, I start wearing down when they start hitting me. It's just the way that it is. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way God created us. So if it's a sport where we literally can be equal, you know, mm -hmm. then definitely, like Billie Jean King and her wonderful, you know, Matt. Yeah, right. about, yeah, she beat him, and he was a man. So in some cases, you know, I would say, no, I don't want to see that. But for the most part, I think it, it would be great, definitely. Okay, so thank thanks. You. Thank you. All right. Out. Yeah. Quick, quick, quick. Here we go. <laughs> uh, Matt Myerson from Mentor, and uh, lately we had the opportunity to record a, a mentoring video uh, together in, in, in Los Angeles where uh, you had a young girl who was mentoring you in, in your journey. And um, it was interesting because my life has been dedicated to trying to promote mentoring and the idea of you doing one oh, event. Oh, I'm like, don't I know you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a light in my... This is, <laughs> this is your life. Yeah, I'm like, like, I that, man. So, <laughs> It's been interesting for me sitting here and thinking how I'm dedicating my life to trying to encourage more people to stand up and become mentors. And you mm -hmm. spent an hour recording a PSA and promoted on your social and the impact that that had and would love to hear from both of you for, for a minute in terms of what you want your legacy to be. You most, both have mentioned mentoring as something that's meaningful to you, but when people look back on you in 20 or 30 or 40 years of your life, not your boxing life, but your, your personal life and, and your impact, what do you want your legacy to, to be for, for both of you? Well, I'll go first because we want her to close the show. Um, I, uh, it, it's a very nice question. I do 
I do more mentoring than anything else uh, these days in writing, talking, anything. And um, I've started several scholarships, including in my, my parents, my late parents' names, about six now each year with Northwestern, my alma mater uh, in Toledo, and with the Women's Sports Foundation, with the, with the Association of Women in Sports Media, our women's sports media group that is uh, very friendly with the Women's Sports Foundation. And, um, and just helping uh, young people get into, into sports media, especially women. And we have thousands of women now covering sports in this country, where we only had a few when I started. So um, it's just uh, hoping that uh, kids can reach their dreams, especially young girls and women, uh, through sports. So that's uh, among, among several things, but that certainly is right up there for me. So thank you very much. And all you. Oh, wow. Well. Yes. <laughs> it's funny. I haven't, I haven't really given that question serious thought. I mean, you might have think that I, that I have. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm right in the thick of it right now, so, um, and still figuring out a lot of things for myself and about myself. Um, but I, I can say that um, giving back is very important to me. Um, inspiring others is important to me. Um, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. A lot of people don't realize that. When my, when my parents got divorced, um, my mom got remarried, and you know I went through a lot. And a lot of that is what turned me into the fighter that I am. Um, so I, I've learned a lot about myself along the way. Um, and I always try to now just try to let others know that you, you never can judge a book by its cover. You know, we know that, that saying. And a lot of people would assume that I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? And that, that wasn't the case. So I literally had to fight um, from a kid. Um, and I'm still fighting now. I mean, now that I retire from boxing, you know, and I'm like, okay, I need to rebrand myself. I don't want to just be the fighter because now I'm in this boxing box. Um, of, you know, first it was like I need to be taken seriously, and now it's like, oh, you know, I want to do TV and cross over, and, you know, I have this fitness and wellness brand, and sometimes I can seem intimidating to people, and I'm like, ah, you know, so it's really about finding, finding balance, and I'm always fighting, right? But, um, yeah, I just want to really help as many other people as I can along the way by w while still being true to myself. I don't think that there's anything wrong with wanting certain things for yourself, right? And then um, figuring out, you know, what God put me on earth for, make myself ha happy, right? And then and, and do the work that I'm here to do and then bring others along the way with me. So I'm never going to just have all the clear answers. I'm still figuring things out. But if I can help others with things that I do know and things that I have figured out, then great. But I never like to come from a place like, oh, I got it all figured out. You know, I'm going to be 40 years old soon, mm -hmm. December 30th. And um, kid so, you. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm excited about it. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, they get they worry about getting older, but I'm just happy to be healthy and have a family and have so many different opportunities, you know, before me. And I feel I really do feel like I can do anything that I want to do. It's just a matter of deciding what I want to do. And I'm really blessed to, I know, to even just have that kind of confidence. And I know that it came through my parents and it came from them by example. My dad didn't sit down and have conversations with me about how to be confident, how to believe in myself. He just believed in himself. He was confident in himself. And you know, the language that we speak, the way we speak about ourselves, the way we speak about others, the conversations that we have in our household, Kids learn from watching. So for me, I want to be that for my kids, and I want to be that for anybody else watching me. Something that I say today might you know, spark something in an individual and, and change their life. So um, that's all. So I, don't, I, don't, I can't say, you know, this is a, I don't have a two-sentence um, answer for that, you know, but whatever you can take from that, um, that's it. That's all I can say. Well, how great. <laughs> I hate to end that way. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.